Good day. It's um, so good to be here with you again. And um, thank you for having me in your places uh, and, and uh, spaces. And however you are receiving this, I pray God blesses you mightily. It's good to open the Word of God together and to uh, share the truth that we find therein. And I pray that God will uh, not only illuminate our minds today as we study uh, the scriptures together, but also uh, give us the strength and faithfulness to uh, carry out what he has asked us to do. So let me ask you, would you consider yourself a faithful person? Would your family and friends describe you as a faithful family member and friend? Do you stay, do you stay true to your word? Do you keep your promises do words like loyal and, and constant resonate with you? Are you a faithful person? Pastor Lewis Guest, uh, in his article for DesiringGod.com, considers the faithfulness of God. But he begins his article by broadly addressing, ever so broadly, the subject of fear, which includes the fear of our own faithlessness. Now, his target audience, of course, are Christians, and he reminds the Christian in his article of the grace and saving power of Christ and the power of the abiding Holy Spirit to produce faithful, faith, faithfulness in our lives. Now, I think I'm going to have a hard time with that word today. Which should encourage each of us to be faithful to God and toward each other. But there will be times of struggles and trials and suffering in this life, yet the Christian the Christian hope and desire is to hear the words from our Lord and Savior, well done, good and faithful servant. But I want us to go back to the times of struggle, trials and suffering. Those uh, times, you know, the kinds of trials that can keep us awake at night, uh, those hard and difficult things, the trials and the suffering that seem to take us by surprise, the death of a loved one or the, the spouse that betrays us those circumstances, those events within our lives and outside our lives that at times seem to be so overwhelming. And speaking to this subject, Pastor Lewis writes, quote, There tends to be a voice that does not strive against our faithlessness, but calls into question the faithfulness of God. Will he come through? Will he do what he has promised? Will he provide? Will he heal? Will he save? Will he strengthen? Will he hold me fast? Well, with this in mind, let's turn to Psalm 119 as we continue our study through Psalm 119. Uh, we're just, we go to verse 25 today, so verse 25 through to 32. Verse 25, my soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. When I told of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous work. works. My soul met, melts away from sorrow, strengthening me according to your word. Put false ways from me, and graciously teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I set your rules before me. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Our Lord and God, we thank you for this opportunity to open up your word and to study it and to hear from you, Lord, this way. We thank you, Lord, that in the word of God, we, we encounter the character and nature of who you are. And we thank you. We ask, Lord, by your spirit to help us understand and as we always pray, to put it into action. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. One day, a very long time ago, the angelic hosts presented themselves before God. And amongst them was the adversary who had come from going to and fro on the earth. And God turned to the adversary and said about his servant, have you considered my servant? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. 
The adversary replied, skin for skin. All that a man has, he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And God replied, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. Well, the adversary did exactly that. He took everything from the servant of God, his children, his servants, his wealth, his work, his property, and even his health. And the servant of God fell to the ground, broken, and he worshipped God. The servant's wife, with bitter, with bitter words, said, Did you, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. And the servant looked up in his brokenness and said, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, the servant did not sin with his lips. I think you might have guessed by now that this is the story of Job that we have recorded for us here in the Bible. And as we begin to look closer at our text for today, Job gives us a framework, an example from the Word of God of someone who experienced great pain and sorrow in their life. And of course, that would be an understatement when we consider all that Job and his wife endured as pretty much all that they loved and cared for was taken from them. And here's the kicker, folks. God, in his sovereign will and purpose, not only allowed this tragedy in Job's life, but it certainly appears as God initiated the whole thing. And this is where most people, Christians included, you and me included, struggle with the idea that God would allow this to happen in the first place. And for God to be a participant in things like this, well, one can only imagine the anger and bitterness that is often placed on God. And when people experience suffering and pain, a common question that is asked, if God is loving, why did he allow pain and suffering into my life? Well, with all this in mind, let's turn to our text. We pick up where we left off last time, recognizing that the, suffer, the psalmist was suffering affliction in his own day. We notice in the text that we have statements like this. My soul clings to the dust, verse 25. My soul melts because of grief, verse 28. Another psalmist put it this way. For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly clings to the ground, Psalm 44, 25. See, in our text, the psalmist used strong uh, pictures, strong images to describe the state of his soul. Friends, this is not someone who was experiencing a momentary setback, a minor and correctable situation. No, the psalmist was experiencing a gut-wrenching affliction of some kind that it impacted deep into his being. One commentator put it this way, quote, the psalmist used a strong image to say that he felt near death in his current crisis. Maybe some of you have heard of or know of C.S. Lewis. He wrote a number of children's stories and a lot of other things as well. Well, C.S. Lewis was a 19th century Christian apologist who was influenced by the way he really remains to this day. And Lewis married late in life to Joy Davidman. She was a scholar and apologist in her own right. So Lewis and Davidman married in 1956. By March of 1957, Joy uh, was diagnosed with incurable cancer. After treatment, Joy went through a brief period of remission until October 1959 when the cancer returned. And it was upon a return from a holiday in Greece that the cancer finally took its toll and Joy died on July 13, 1960 at the age of 45. And after a while, after a time, Lewis, using an alias, wrote a book called A Grief Observed. A Grief Observed. And this came from the journals that he compiled, recalling his overwhelming, overwhelming grief over the death of his wife. And Lewis there recounts the challenges to his wavering faith in God due to that crushing effect of grief and his struggle and journey to regain that faith. 
One, I suppose, could surmise, pardon me, again, I'm struggling with words here, surmise that his experience close to the end of his own life would lead Lewis to gain an important insight to the place of suffering when he considered his faith in God. For Lewis once said this, quote, I suggest to you that this, that I suggest to you that it is because God loves us that he gives us the gift of suffering. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. You see, we are the blocks of stone out of which the sculptor carves the forms of men. The blows of his chisel, of his, of his chisel which hurt us so much, are what makes us perfect. End quote. Well, returning to our text, consider with me the psalmist and his response to suffering and affliction in his own life as he prayed to God and said, Give me life according to your word. Friends, right off the top, there's something that needs to be said. We can't minimize the depth of the suffering the psalmist would have been enduring. For one thing, we don't have the details. We don't know what he was suffering from or with. We don't have the details. Secondly, you and I, we are never in a position to gauge the depth of pain anyone experiences because, my friends, it's not our pain to experience. And that's what we do sometimes. We compare our experiences and say things like, put your trust in God. And if it seems like the one who is suffering is not trusting God, we say something dumb like, you don't have enough faith. No, we don't know the death of suffering the psalmist had experienced. We don't know how long it was before he prayed this prayer that is recorded for us here in the text. Maybe for a time he was angry with God. Maybe he didn't trust God for a time. Maybe he doubted his faith for a time. We don't know. But what we do know is that he eventually turned to God and prayed, Give me life according to your word. And further along in this very same psalm, he said, This is my comfort in my affliction, that your promise gives me life. Verse 50. So the psalmist, my friends, opened up his life to God. He told, he recounted his ways. Verse 26. That phrase, of my ways, in Hebrew means road, journey. The psalmist had turned to God and laid it all upon God. His pain, his doubts, his faith, all of it. And God answered, for we read, you answered me, in verse 26. Now, did the pain go away? Did the suffering go away? Well, it doesn't look like it did at this moment. For he said, my soul weeps because of grief, verse 28. No, we don't know, but we do know that the psalmist turned to God in prayer and God answered. God answered him. Where do you turn, my friends, when pain and suffering hits you right between the eyes? I don't want you to answer that too quickly. I want you to think carefully about your response. Think back. How did you respond to suffering and pain? Before And how did other respond, others respond to your suffering? Keep that in your mind. And as we look here, each verse, verse 25 to 32, contains a synonym for the Word of God. So here's the question. Where did the psalmist turn to in his suffering? Answer, we've already said, or alluded to for sure, God. But notice he turned to the Word of God and the promises of God found therein. And the psalmist prayed to God to give him life. In other words, to revive him. And opening up his life to God, the psalmist prayed that God would teach him the word of God. That God would give the psalmist understanding in the ways of God. Through the word of God. And friends, King David prayed in a similar way one time where David said, Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. Psalm 25, verse 4 and 5. So, friends, the psalmist looked up from his affliction and suffering to do what? To meditate on God's wonders. To meditate on God. Verse 27. We go back to King David, and, and, and in his song of praise, David said, On the glorious splendor of your majesty, on your wondrous works, I will meditate. 
They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. Psalm 145, verse 5 and 6. So let me ask you again, where do you turn when pain and suffering hits you between the eyes? Where does your help come from? Do you turn inward? Close yourself off from all things? Or you do you respond as the psalmist put it? I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Psalm 121 verse 1 and 2. So, dear friends, the psalmist prayed for a revived life, for understanding, and he also prayed for strength in his affliction. Look at verse 28. Strengthen, and strengthen me according to your word. This phrase, strengthen me, means grammatically and in context, to establish, to establish. Isaiah the prophet, let's go there. He prophesied, and declared to Israel that a time was to come when Israel would be taken into captivity for their idolatry and disobedience to the commands of God. And of course, we know the rest is history. It's right there for us in the Bible. Uh, it's interesting to note that God, through the prophet, even before, through the prophet Isaiah, even before they were taken into captivity, said, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41.10. And as God would do for Israel when they went into captivity, which God himself sent them into captivity, God would do for the psalmist here in his trials. I have some more questions for you. Have you ever experienced the grass is greener on the other side syndrome? Or how about idealizing the past syndrome? For example, we find ourselves in a difficult relationship and we might say, well, Sally at work gives me the respect I don't get at home anymore. Or our workspace is draining and exhausting day in and day out and some might say, time to move on to a better job. Or that trial and, and, and affliction has us focused on those better days gone by. You know, friends, it's to be expected, isn't it? That our fallen human nature is to look for better grass on the other side, to sem sentimentalize the past, those better days we left behind. Let's be honest. Let's be truly honest. Our tendency as a fallen human person is to complain and whine. Check out the history of Israel. Check out the story of Exodus. You know, God literally rescued the Israelites from slavery. God, with no effort on his part, took down the most powerful nation at that time and brought his people out of abject slavery. And what did Israel do? It complained and whined. Check out numbers for yourself. They'd been wandering in the desert and they were tired of the manna that God provided them every day to feed them. They were tired of the clothes that would never wear out and the sandals that would never wear out. They wanted burgers. They wanted steaks. They wanted pina coladas. And they complained so much that even Moses himself went down the same path of complaining to God. What happened? Well, you should read it for yourself, but this is what happened God sent a wind from the sea and brought plenty of quail, birds, plenty of quail, right into the camp of Israel. Man, they had plenty of meat. And out came the barbecues and the barbecue sauce and the ketchup and the mustard. And just as the Israelites were taking their first bites, while the meat was still in their teeth, the text tells us, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck down the people with a great plague. Numbers 11.33. What happened? Well, the Israelites doubted the faithfulness of God. They disobeyed the commandments of God. They tried to do it on their own. Well, back to our text. It seems here that the psalmist knew all too well of his tendency, his human nature, to look for the greener grass, to do it by himself. For he said here in verse 29, put false ways from 
far from me and graciously, Lord, graciously teach me your law. The NIV translate part of this text this way, keep me from deceitful ways. Here in the book of Psalms, those 150 Psalms in this book, we find an actual prayer of Moses where he said, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Psalm 90, 14. My friends, the grass isn't always greener and the past in reality was not that great, but God's love is steadfast every morning. Steadfast every morning. Well, let's move on to verse 30 to 32. Looking at these uh, verses here, 30 to 32, we find statements like, I have chosen, I have set, I cling to, and I will run. What was the psalmist up to here? One commentator said about these verses, quote, In the beginning of the section, he is clinging to the dust. By the end, he's clinging to God's word. In the beginning, he is laid low. Now he is joyfully running with all his strength in the race God's word set before him. You guys remember Joshua, the great general after Moses? Well, in chapter 24, we find that Joshua gathered all the tribes and the elders and the judges and the officers of Israel as he was coming to the end of his life. This is called the covenant renewal at Shechem. While chapter 24 has so much in it, we look at verse 22 where Joshua reminded the Israelites, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. Joshua, Joshua 24, 22. Back to our text. The psalmist had committed to put the word of God, as he put it, before me, verse 30. That the race he would run now, recognizing his own weakness, was to choose the way of God. We notice that his prayer that it would be that his heart would be enlarged. The prayer that the psalmist's very inner person would be enlarged, trusting in the steadfast love of God in his affliction. Trusting that God would protect him even in his trials. Friends, this is not some passive response from someone who just kind of knows the word of God. No, this is, this is someone who put his trust in the faithful God, who keeps his promises beyond the pain, beyond the temporary nature of life. Here we find the psalmist trusting in the eternal God beyond his very own mortal existence. What do we do then when we ask, will God fail me now? When we doubt the faithful, faithfulness of God, what do we do? Let me offer you three things. Three things to start. There's so many more things I'm sure you can discover in the Word of God. First, we do. First, my friends, we do. Jesus once told the story about building a house in Luke chapter 6. You find it there, verse 46 to 49. And one man laid a foundation, Jesus said, deep on a rock. And when the flood came, the house stood firmly in place. Another man built his house on the ground with no foundation. And when the flood came, the house fell. James puts it this way. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. James 1.22. It's one thing to know the word of God. It's another thing to do the word of God. Second, God keeps. Second, God keeps. Keeps what? He keeps his word. Pastor Lewis puts it this way, quote, Our God is a doer of his word. Our God is a doer of his word. Moses writes, God is not man that he should lie, of a son of man that he should change his mind. He has said, and will he not do it? Numbers 23, 19. The apostle Paul reminded the believers in Philippi that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 6. God is faithful to keep his promises. Thirdly, remember. Thirdly, remember. Remember what? God's faithfulness. We go back to Joshua. And he's telling the people this. That not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. The writer of Hebrew reminds the followers of Jesus Christ that God will not fail his children. The Hebrew writer said this, Let us hold fast 
the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Hebrews 10, 23. My friends, my dear friends, your circumstances, your doubts, your lack of faith, your struggles, your trials, your joys, everything, all of life has no bearing, has no effect on the faithfulness of God. Apostle Paul, writing to his dear friend and co-laborer Timothy, said this, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. 2 Timothy 2.13 You see, my friends, the word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, declares that God is faithful to himself, faithful to keep his word. So first, we do. Secondly, God keeps. Thirdly, we remember. Let us pray. Our Lord and God, we thank you. We thank you that you are the faithful one. You are the faithful one. When, even when we are faith, faithful, we are faithless. You are the faithful one. You sustain us. You endure. You walk with us in the valley. You, uh, you, you delight with us on the top of the mountain. Oh Lord, you are so good. All the time you are good and faithful. And I pray for my brothers and my sisters, wherever they are, as they struggle in life, or whatever they're struggling with now, that they would lift up their heads and they will look onto the mountain and know that their help comes from you, O oh Lord, the faithful Lord. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless, friends. Shalom.